All right, everyone. <clears throat> I'm your host, Raymond Flotat, and welcome to episode 34 of This Week is Live. So glad to see you all. It is an absolute bonkers week for news and information. I could literally sit here for the next 12 hours just recounting albums that have been announced and tours that have been announced. I could be here till four in the morning, cracked out and bloodshot eyes. But we're not going to do that because there's a lot of significant and weighty stuff happening. Also, by the way of an announcement, I've been teasing for quite a long time. We're going to have something special, and this is the beginning of lots of different kinds of content from us in the video sector. Well, today, we bring you something extra, extra special. A little while back, we, four of us, filmed a session playing a game that was built into Kid Koala's album, Creatures of the Late Afternoon. Kid Koala is a turntablist. We're going to talk about that a little bit near the end of the show. And effectively, he has been long doing great albums and been a part of great projects and the various things that he's done. And in his latest album, into the vinyl release of the album, he basically designed a board game that is totally a part of the vinyl release. So we got a copy of that, and four of us sat down and played that game while listening to the album. We filmed the whole thing. We edited it, put the package together. That is going to be the end of this broadcast. As we wrap up, usually where the editorial comment will be, there is a very long session of us playing and joking around and having a good time, and I firmly encourage all of you to stay and watch it. It's going to be great. Now, as part of anyone here on Twitch watching this right now or seeing this live on Instagram or Tumblr or any of the other places that we broadcast this live, that's going to be a part of this broadcast. But then when we post this later on YouTube, for those of you that watch on YouTube or the other places we post this after the fact, that will be the show proper, and we'll have a separate posting on YouTube for just our Let's Play of Creatures of the Late Afternoon. So stand by as we go through today's headlines. We're going to have something very special, and it's a lot of fun. We've been waiting quite a while to bring this to you, and so please stick around at the end of the show for that. It's going to be a blast. Now, moving on to today's headlines, and in holy smokes, the most pertinent of news, because most of America watches television and movies. <laughs> Very few people out there are anti-movies or anti-TV completely. So for any of you that watch television, it's not like sports, right? Like you're watching scripted or entertainment of any capacity. Well, things are going to get a bit bumpy for a while because as of this afternoon, the Screen Actors Guild, SAG as it's known, has effectively announced that it is going to be going on strike at 12.01 a.m. So Screen Actors Guild, for those who don't know, SAG-AFTRA is the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists. Now this comes on the heels of what has been the news that has been already plaguing movies and TVs, which is the Writers Guild of America, the WGA, which is the union that represents the writers that write for TV and movies. They went on strike a couple months ago and nothing has been resolved there. Almost all productions that weren't you know, already finished being written basically had to stop or were being stopped or got halted before very far could go. Lots of things are already getting delayed as the process is moving forward. Well, the same problem, more or less the same problem. There's some slightly different issues, obviously, in between the different unions and, you know, all of that. But effectively, the same kind of stop gaps, residual raise, you know, better pay. How does AI affect the industry? Those issues have not been resolved. And just like the WGA, SAG has been negotiating with AMPTP, which is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. So they are basically the group that represents the major studios, Netflix, Paramount, Sony, NBC, Universal, Apple, Disney, Warner Brothers, Discovery. So they're, no, they're negotiating on behalf of the networks, the production companies. And in this case, the actors are being represented by SAG-AFTRA, or SAG as it's commonly referred to. So effectively, negotiations broke down. And then effectively, there was a vote this afternoon, just this very afternoon from the guild and its you know leadership. And effectively, as of 1201, to be specific, midnight Pacific Standard Time, so that'll be 301 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for those of you that are curious, effectively, SAG actors are on strike. And this means a litany of things that they basically cannot do for anyone that should have a contract with SAG in general in terms of collective bargaining agreements. So that means on-camera work, acting, singing, dancing, performing stunts, piloting on-camera aircraft. Didn't know that was something under SAG, but there you go. Puppeteering, performance capture, motion capture work, principal off-camera work, ADR looping, TV trailers. Very interestingly to a lot of the different pieces of the puzzle that connect a lot of other things beyond just television, but voice acting. Uh-oh, a lot of things require voice acting, singing, narration work, background work, stand-in work, Everything's going to grind to a halt behind this. So effectively, as everything was moving forward, you know, 
things started to go to a place where they were trying to hash out a deal. And then they basically got to a point where they're like, they were tired of it and they basically wanted to walk away from that in that respect. Now, this is interesting to note because this is the first time that SAG has been on strike since 1980. So that's 43 years for those that are keeping score here. And this is the first time that both SAG and the WGA have been on strike since 1960, which coincidentally was when Ronald Reagan, former President Ronald Reagan, was the head of the Screen Actors Guild. For those of you that don't know, most people know this, but Ronald Reagan was an actor prior to his career in politics. And effectively, so this is kind of a big deal. And you know, give yourself about four, six months, and then you're going to see a lot of original content basically grind to a halt. You're probably going to see rise in reality content, competition content, things that are unscripted. It's going to be kind of wacko in that respect. And, you know, a lot of people watch a lot of shows, a lot of television, a lot of movies. So it's going to be really tough. And, of course, never mind the fact that this comes on the heel of news that Deadline was reporting earlier this week. They're claiming, you know, anonymous sources, no one that we can attribute to, but they're claiming that some of the companies out there that are negotiating with the WGA, their notion is hold the line until... This is, again, allegedly, this is really kind of anonymous sources that Deadline has, hold the line until basically people start losing their homes. And this has basically people incensed in the world of acting and writing in terms of the bargaining posture behind this and that basically nothing's happening. So you're going to feel and see and hear a lot of animosity between the many, many, many people who are the people that make all of this go every day, but of course aren't going to be able to make a living. And that, of course, that means there's no writers, there's no actors. Nobody else can work either, right? You can't be a set dresser or a person on props or lighting or visual effects if there's no show to do that stuff for. So there's going to be a fair degree of frustration and animosity, and there's going to be a lot of saber rattling until any of this can actually be resolved. Uh, interestingly, for those who don't know, SAG's president is actress Fran Drescher, who was a big you know, part of the fixture in the late 90s in television. And she had this to say, SAG after negotiating in good faith and was eager to reach a deal that was sufficiently addressed performer needs. But the ANPTP's response to the union's most important proposals have been insulting and disrespectful of our massive contributions to this industry. The companies have refused to meaningfully engage on some topics and on others completely stonewalled us. Until they do negotiate in good faith, we cannot begin to reach a deal. We have no choice but to move forward in unity and on behalf of our membership with a strike recommendation to our national board. The board will discuss this issue in the morning and will make its decision. Of course, that's already happened. They've already voted. The strike's going to happen <clears throat> at 12.01 tonight, Pacific time. Um, <clears throat> effectively, on the other side, the NPTP issued this statement just after 1 a.m. We are deeply disappointed that sag has decided to walk away from negotiations. This is the union's choice, not ours. So they're advocating responsibility in this. In doing so, it is dismissed and our offer of historic pay and residual increases, substantially higher caps on pension and health contributions, audition protections, shortened series option periods, a groundbreaking AI proposal that protects actors' digital likenesses, and more. Note that that doesn't say we won't use AI to make content, which is certainly one of the big sticking points here. Rather than continuing to negotiate, sag has put us on a course that will deepen the financial hardship for thousands who depend on the industry for their livelihoods. Ultimately... Apparently, as a part of the negotiations were, you know, falling apart, weren't going super well. Essentially, there was apparently a last-ditch effort to bring in a federal mediator to try to avert a walkout. But ultimately, the moment that happened, this was a big part of why everything basically disintegrated. So there you have it, folks. And it's going to get ugly and bloody. There's going to be a lot of people who are frustrated that they don't have content that they want to watch. And there's going to be a whole lot of people that are frustrated that they can't work they can't make money and make a living and do the things that they need to do to be a part of movies and television. And so this is going to be a wild series of months until and unless everybody's able to find a deal and be able to work something out. But I don't know. <laughs> it just doesn't feel like something to me that's going to be resolved quickly. That would be my guess in this. Uh, kind of strangely, coincidentally, just yesterday, the 2023 Emmy nominations were announced. And within that, there's actually, you know, some pretty good, I would say, as far as what award shows can be, like some pretty good and standard, you know, solid, uh, basically nominations for deserving content. Some years, the Emmys are known for, you know, nominating great shows like Stranger Things or Game of Thrones and then still giving the award to like The Crown, you know, a period PC kind of thing. But for what it's worth, what's here seems certainly very deserving. So 
the Emmys have always been a thing where, well, not always, but at least for the last 10, 20 years, there's been basically kind of a dividing line between drama and comedy, musical and comedy and drama. Usually, you know, the twain does not meet and that content is essentially split up. So for outstanding drama series, there's Andor, Better Call Saul, The Crown, House of the Dragon, The Last of Us. Yay. Happy to see that. Succession, The White Lotus and Yellow Jackets. Now, for just about anybody who pays attention to television, you'll know that you know, probably certainly there's a fair degree of people that do like The Crown, just might be different kinds of fans than the rest of the content mentioned there. All those shows are shows that people really liked. Andor's a great show. Succession's a great show. Yellow Jacket's a great show. Everyone loves The White Lotus. House of the Dragon was surprisingly good considering where Game of Thrones ended. I mean, there's a lot of really rock-solid stuff in there, not to mention The Last of Us was brilliant and as deservingly good as we all hoped it would be. On the other side, for Outstanding Comedy Series, there's Abbott Elementary, which has been a big hit for ABC. Barry, which people are ranting and raving about. I'll concede that I have not actually had a chance to watch Barry yet. I will do that very soon. The Bear, which people are also very much freaking out right now in its second season. Jury Duty, The End of the, Mar the Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Only Murders in the Milding, which, you know, Steve Martin and Martin Short and Selena Gomez, uh, Ted Lasso in its final and, by the way, holy smokes, incredible final season. And then the runaway hit Wednesday for Netflix. Um, interestingly, also to point out, and basically the main acting categories, I'm not going to go through all of it because there's so many different categories and so many different people, but a few really interesting kind of nuggets within this. For outstanding lead actor in a drama series, in addition to Jeff Bridges for The Old Man, who seems to be nominated anytime he shows up in anything nowadays, whether it's movies or TV, you can pretty much count on Jeff Bridges getting a big nomination. But then, other than Bob Odenkirk for Better Call Saul, who's been nominated several times, and Pedro Pascal for The Last of Us, which he certainly obviously deserves to be nominated, there are not one but two, but three people from Succession nominated in this category, which is basically the first time ever. Brian Cox, Kieran Culkin, and Jeremy Strong, all nominated for their, you know, very much talked about parts on the show. Um, in the lead actress in a drama series category, there is Sharon Horgan from Bad Sisters. I actually don't know, really do not really know that one. Um, <clears throat> Melanie Linsky for Yellow Jackets, not really a surprise. Elizabeth Moss from The Handmaid's Tale, also not a surprise. Bella Ramsey from The Last of Us, super thrilled to see that in there. Carrie Russell from The Diplomat, and Sarah Snook, another person from Succession. So that makes four people total for the major acting categories for Succession. And also interesting and something that, I mean, this would be a fairly obvious one to me. I would be shocked to see this go otherwise. I cannot say enough personally, if you have not seen it, if you have not watched The Last of Us, and I know many of you have, but if you have not watched The Last of Us on HBO, the bottle episode, as it were, that featured Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett. I'm not going to spoil anything of what it is, the story that those two actors have together and this little bottle piece of The Last of Us universe, but it is fan freaking tastic and i would be stunned if nick offerman did not win outstanding guest actor in a drama series for this i mean this is the kind of reason an award like that even exists is <laughs> because quite literally how good his performance in this was if you have not seen it do yourself a favor and go and watch if nothing else that episode because it is just masterful and breathtaking and heartbreaking it is so freaking good so Elsewhere, an outstanding leader, a lead actor in a comedy series. There's Bill Hader for Barry, Martin Short for Only Murders, Jason Siegel for Trinking. Wasn't a big fan of that show personally. Jason Sudeikis for Ted Lasso. Be surprised if he doesn't win. Uh, Jeremy Allen White for The Bear. And then on the other side, outstanding lead actress, we have uh, Christina Applegate, Rachel Brosnahan, Quinta Brunson, and some others. I lost my other piece of paper, so we're going to skip that one piece of it. But all kinds of interesting stuff, and me being the nerd for award shows that I am, I will certainly be watching when the Emmys do go on the air. Now, in the world of games, just to shift gears a bit from all this TV and movies heavy stuff, there has been a kind of long-standing fight. We've mentioned it a few times before on this show where Microsoft has been looking to acquire Activision Blizzard. Now, Microsoft, of course, is the company behind Xbox, and they have been trying for a very, very long time to compete with Nintendo and Sony PlayStation to limited degrees of success, depending on like what Halo title was coming out or what Gears of War title was coming out. Always kind of third place in terms of the giant fight for the console video game wars. And effectively, what they realized which Sony had been kind of artfully, quietly doing, building up their own studios and first-party exclusives, which is that effectively first-party exclusive titles like Nintendo has Mario or Sony has Uncharted or The Last of Us is what drives a platform. 
Now that was for them Halo when Halo was in its glory and that was their kind of thing, but they basically just started trying to gobble up studios. And of course, Microsoft for a long time there was the biggest company on planet Earth. So they certainly have the money to try to go and buy these other major companies. And then of course, this attempted acquisition of Activision Blizzard is one of those moves in an effort to try to basically shore up the market and give themselves more exclusives. Part of the things that have come out in this is that one of the big upcoming titles, Starfield, part of the reason they wanted to buy Activision Blizzard was to try to make it an exclusive for the platform. This is also why they bought Tim Schafer's studio and everything he does with Psychonauts. This was basically a part of trying to give them first part exclusive content so that there would be a reason for people to not wait for stuff to come out on other platforms. You want it, you have to get Xbox. So this has been a big ugly legal fight which comes down to the federal trade commission here in america and there is a similar problem in the united kingdom in terms of is this an antitrust problem is this anti-competitive business practice is this shoring up too much of the market well microsoft seemingly has had a victory in that capacity as they've been zeroing in on this in the wake of how they basically have been at an injunction filed against them by the ftc and then it has been going through district court in the Northern District of California, and the judge presiding, Jacqueline Scott Corley, has basically issued a ruling, apparently as a part of ongoing structure strategy negotiations as far as how Microsoft has been trying to handle this to clear regulators' hurdles, but effectively, you know, basically removing the ability for the injunction within this. And she had the following to say, this court's responsibility in this case is narrow. It is to decide if, notwithstanding these current circumstances, the merger should be halted perhaps even terminated pending resolution of the FTC administrative action. <clears throat> For the reasons explained, the court finds the FTC has not shown a likelihood it will prevail on its claim this particular vertical merger in the specific industry may substantially lessen competition. To the, contra to the contrary, the record evidence points to more consumer access to Call of Duty and other Activision content. The motion for a preliminary injunction is therefore denied. We are disappointed, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Effectively, the opposite side has basically said, the FTC, they said, we are disappointed in this outcome given the clear threat this merger poses to open competition in cloud gaming, subscription services, and console. This is according to FTC spokesperson Douglas Farrar. In the coming days, we'll announce our next steps to continue our fight to preserve competition and protect consumers. So effectively, they were, as, as far as considerations in terms of different pieces of what they're offering in terms of making you know, Call of Duty available for 10 years on platforms other than Xbox, and then also being able to bring it to Nintendo Switch was basically a part of how they were able to sweeten the deal and say, hey, you should let us have this merger go through. Then elsewhere in the world of music, and this is the kind of thing where it's interesting and significant, but ultimately sad and, you know, just, I don't know ravages of time and age we all get older things just don't start to work well when you get older legendary hard rock and heavy metal vocalist Ozzy Osbourne has announced that he had to back out of his I don't know six times co-headlining I don't know how you want to term it with this festival slot at the Power Trip Festival and the Power Trip Festival is kind of like another version of what Golden Voice did with what was called Desert Trip a few years ago where they had Bob Dylan and the Rolling Stones and Roger Waters, basically like a classic rock mega fest where six people played, or six acts played over a period of three nights in the same spot that Coachella itself happens at the Empire Polo Field. So this one is basically like monsters of hard rock quasi metal and it was originally supposed to be Ozzy Osbourne Guns N' Roses, ACDC, Metallica, Iron Maiden, and Tool. And basically there were rumblings that maybe Ozzy would have to back out. And then, of course, officially, Ozzy has now officially backed out from this event. And he basically said in the announcement that he was going to step back, that there would be a replacement announced soon. And it turned out that the announcement, the person, the band replacing them would be Judas Priest, which is certainly super great. Judas Priest are a legend too in the world of heavy metal. And this is, you know, unfortunate because Ozzy Osbourne has been plagued by a myriad of health concerns and health problems. He was diagnosed a couple of years ago with Parkinson's disease. He had to have major spinal surgery. A part of what's keeping him out of this is apparently the recovery process from that spinal surgery that he had. And, you know, Ozzy's a legend in the world of rock and roll and one of the more revered people. I mean, it's rare that you can point to a band in terms of his, you know, contributions to Black Sabbath in the late 60s, early 70s, between their first album and, you know, the self-titled record and Paranoid, where they basically created a genre. 
there's different people that'll argue about like Led Zeppelin being the first heavy metal band and blah, blah, blah. But as great as all that was, it's kind of the thing. If you ask any given person who's a fan of heavy metal, it all basically maps to Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath is why that whole gigantic genre exists and all its offshoots and all its forms. And then, of course, in addition to the incredible work that he did in Black Sabbath, all the years he kind of in and out, back in again, retired, back on again, all the great stuff that he did with Black Sabbath, he's equally famous for solo albums, the first two of which featuring the late and legendary guitarist Randy Rhodes. So... This is one of those things where Ozzy's retired numerous times, and even once going so far back as the early 90s, having a tour called No More Tours for Ozzy as a part of his No More Tears record where Zach Wilde was a guitar player. And essentially, you know, this is the kind of thing where every few years it's looked like he was going to hang it up, and then he didn't, and he kept going. And he very much clearly does want to keep going. But unfortunately, this was a part of a growing rash of things. The pandemic caused their planned tour in Europe with Judas Priest opening to be delayed and delayed and delayed and then open and eventually basically had to be canceled and terminated. So it was surprising to even see Ozzy slated to play this event. And, you know, from all reports and all indications, he very much still wants to get out there. He very much wants to get out there and play, but is basically wisely sitting this one out and saying, until well, my body basically tells me it's safe to go, then I'll go. And here's to hoping is, you know, for whatever you think of it, here's to hoping he does continue to get better. He does continue to feel like he can. And, you know, this doesn't become something that's a bigger and worse problem, whether he does want to play live or doesn't want to play live. Ozzy's a legend. Hopefully everything continues to improve for him. And then lastly, coming from our UK department and our wonderful folks over at Mixdown UK, Blur. Now, Blur is a kind of band that uh, they're legends in the United Kingdom. They're one of those things that just never really cross the pond over here in America quite as big. I mean, people know them. They have they have a few songs that are big, and most people know Damon Albarn and his output a little bit more for Gorillaz in terms of Gorillaz, in terms of their kind of like mashup pop approach, putting all these different things into a blender, into kind of a pop-heavy cartoon band. But in the United Kingdom, Blur are kind of the Beatles, <laughs> and along with Oasis, they're just legends on that side of the pond over there in Europe. And they have been back together for a while kind of on and off and now more recently they have announced a new record called the ballad of Dar the ballad of darren and they're going to be playing a show coming up on july 25th at the eventum apollo in hammersmith london and what's interesting about all this is that they're going to be doing this album the ballad of darren and at least as a press time we'll see if this actually sticks they're claiming that they're going to do this album in its entirety for the only time the first and only time they're going to play this new album Front to back, they're going to play the entire thing. Certainly, Blur has a gigantic catalog full of lots of great albums and songs. But they're going to focus this show on the new album, The Ballad of Darren. And interestingly, people who want to see the live stream, not to buy a ticket to do it, but there's a pre-sale to the pre-sale, which is a, kind of a new one on me. I mean, I've definitely seen times where live streams are both free and ticketed, and it all depends on the band, what the band can command. But in this particular instance, you need to, at least as far as what the, the instructions on their website basically indicate right now, you must pre-order the album in some capacity. Interestingly, in addition to CD and cassette, and a lot of people will talk a lot of crap about compact discs, but bands are certainly still trying to sell them. And But they also are selling the new album in cassette format, which is a wild throwback to when I was very young. My first album I ever bought with my own money was Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion 1 and 2. I mentioned that in an early broad, earlier broadcast of this show a few months back. But effectively, it's kind of wild to think because I would have thought that's a dead technology at this point, but there they are. They're still printing and making cassettes, and some bands are still trying to sell them to you. I don't even know how many of you out there even have cassette players anymore. I would love to know. Write us and tell us if you have a cassette player and you still use it. But interestingly, if you buy the pre-order of this album, The Ballad of Darren, then that will be given to you sometime on July 18th, a link to buy a ticket to the live stream. Interesting, fascinating little thing. And, you know, for Blur fans, probably something they're very excited about. So... Coming off of that, we're going to head into kind of our finale here, and I wanted to talk a little bit because we mentioned we're going to have a special thing broadcast a part of the show, which is our playing, which features me, <clears throat> Lisa Kumjohn-Smith, Cassandra, our music editor, and 
Tess from our movies team and the four of us basically playing this game and having a hilarious silly time while we listen to the album Creature of the Late Afternoon. Kikawala is what we would commonly call, if you're not familiar, a DJ. That's the simplest way of putting it. I like to think of Kikawala's music as turntablism, which is, you know, not just sequencing stuff up in the simplest form to just be background music or to, you know, find a way to sync up cuts to have a seamless mix to allow people to dance or anything. Kid Koala has always been a person taking turntables and turning them into the most brilliant of instruments. It is a fascinating and wonderful thing to behold if you've ever had a chance to see Kid Koala in any capacity as a part of any project. It is a wild, fresh, and fun thing to see what Kit Koala is capable of. I would say kind of in alignment with DJ Z Trip. DJ Z Trip is now kind of famously LL Cool J's DJ when you know LL Cool J does live shows. But Z Trip was one of the more fascinating and fun DJs ever to watch, and it was a lot about how he thought about mixing up music. Kit Koala is a different kind of animal in terms of basically just how to think about what's possible with it. Also, what's been fascinating is Kid Kowal's interests have expanded over time. He's found different ways to incorporate his own art, to some extent puppetry. There have been shows I've seen where there were basically mechanisms of limited puppetry where other people were helping perform aspects of what was being cued, synced, scratched, however you want to put it. And essentially, you know, it's a whole new fascinating realm of it. There are tours that Kickwall's done, which he called headphone shows, where people would sit in beanbags and they'd have headphones on and quietly listen to a show instead of, you know, jump up and down and dance or whatever you, you know personally like to do when you go to a show. He's also been a part of many really great things. And going all the way back to the origins of Mixed Down, one of the earliest albums we ever reviewed was his album, Some of My Best Friends Are DJs. That comes on the heels of his early breakout hit, Carpal Tunnel Syndrome. But then as the years went on, there was also his album, 12-Bit Blues in 2012, if you haven't heard that. Wonderful, very simple, minimalist record from a turntablist. And then a couple of records called Permutations of Music to Draw To. These are Music to Draw To Satellite and Music to Draw To IO. But then now, of course, this year, coming back a couple months, Creature of the Late Afternoon. But elsewhere, in different facets of his career, there's also been a slew of other projects that he was involved with, most significantly Deltron 3030, and then the very first piece of content to ever launch on this publication, Lovage, Music to Make Love to Your Old Lady By, which was a project he was in with Dan the Automator, the famed producer, hip-hop producer, and early Gorillaz collaborator, Jennifer Charles from Elysian Fields, and legendary singer in the modern rock alt-rock space, Mike Patton. If you have not heard that record, do yourself a favor. Probably one of the single best records of Mixdown's era of existence. Just wonderful, wonderful masterpiece of an album. But then also a project that not a lot of people talk about recently, but they should, which was called The Slew. And The Slew was as a band that was kind of coming from some interest in a soundtrack, but it was him and Dynamite D. And then two of the original members of Wolfmother when Wolfmother first started and the four of them basically together in what I would call some combination of a psych rock band. It was fascinating. So Kika Wall has had a wonderful career and has done really, really great stuff. And very recently we had the pleasure of interviewing him. We did a whole video interview with him. We'll link that in the YouTube description when this gets posted on YouTube. Our writer Kennedy spoke to him and he... <sighs> open, sweet, very kind person, really, really great guy. And effectively, like I say, everything that he's involved with, including some oddball projects that I don't think ever saw the light of day, really. Dan the Automator had a band with Emily Wells called Pillow Fight that Kit Koala, at least when I saw them live at South by Southwest, was the turntablist with the DJ for. So there's been tons of really great stuff coming from his life and his career. So we basically sat down for an afternoon and we played the hell out of this game. And so now what you're about to see is the footage of us playing this game. There's some light editing for time, for setting up records and different kinds of change-ups in there. But this is kind of a hilarious look at the four of us on the fly trying to get the hang of this game and basically singing its praise because it's fun, it's silly, there's different mechanics. And one of the things that was really cool was he actually took to the technology of putting stuff behind a lock groove on the record. So there's certain things that happen in the board game when you go to do it. And essentially you hit the right space and then it basically says you pull a card and it tells you which record to put on and then you have to put the needle 
on the right point past the lock groove. And then one of them is a memory matching game where you have to make match pairs of tiles on the board. And another one's a staring contest. We didn't get the staring contest very much, but it was hilarious and a ton of fun. Even on my turntable, which isn't the best turntable in the world, it was a little challenging to get the needle past the lock groove. So some of you probably have better record players than I do. Mine's a bit old and not a super great or expensive record player, but ultimately it still worked and it was great. So sit back, relax. We're going to begin the broadcast of this right now, and there's going to be a good while of this. So enjoy our broadcast of Creatures of Late Afternoon. I'll send my sign off right here right now before I begin playing our session of Let's Play Creatures of Late Afternoon by saying well, thank you again for joining us. It was so glad to see you well. If you don't already and you're not already doing so, please follow us on Twitch, subscribe to us on YouTube. Thank you for sharing and joining us wherever you see these clips, whether it's here on Twitch, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's when we post little clips of this in you know Instagram or in YouTube Shorts or in Facebook or Twitter, any of the other places you do. But please keep joining us every week. This is the beginning, and we're going to have a major announcement coming in just a couple weeks about something else fun that we're going to be doing in the video realm. I'll have a little bit more information on that next week and next week's show, but that is coming in a couple weeks. We're going to have something special happening here on the show in a couple weeks to herald that. But for now, sit back, enjoy, let's play Creature of the Late Afternoon. <laughs> 